Thank you very much, first and foremost, for inviting me. This is quite an honor for me to have been invited to this group. I have spoken before at the mosque in Sterling, Virginia, which was quite an honor. And I've met the imam there and uh, have met him subsequently in several places. A wonderful group of people. My story is, unfor is fortunately a very happy one. Happy in the sense that when you talk about the Holocaust, it is not what you usually hear. I just met this week at the Holocaust Museum with 50 students from a Hebrew day school. They went through the museum. It's the uh, Berman School or the Hebrew Academy. And of course, very, <coughs> excuse me, obviously a very um, sad day for them. I met with them at the end of the day, and I told them that what they will hear from me maybe will help them a little bit to overcome what they had just seen of all the horror and tragedy. So here's my story. I was born in Germany, in Hamburg, where my mother's family had lived for no less than 300 years. My father was born in Germany. My father had fought for Germany, for the German Kaiser. He had been an officer. Thank you. Um, they were German Jews. Hitler came to power, and all of a sudden, everything changed very, very quickly. 1933, first the judges could no longer be judges. The lawyers could no longer serve anyone but Jewish clients. Doctors were not allowed to treat anyone but Jewish uh, patients, etc., etc. As a child of seven, eight years old, I could no longer go to a playground. I couldn't go to a movie house. I couldn't go to a theater. I couldn't go to the beach. Wherever you went, there were signs up. Jews not wanted. 1938, November 10th, 9th to the 10th. Most people call it Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass, or like one of my German friends says, crystal is something beautiful. He would never call it Kristallnacht. He would only call it the November program. Spontaneously, or not so spontaneously, of, as we well know, every synagogue in Austria and in Germany was attacked. In many cases, burned down. In many cases, damaged very badly. The holy books, the Torah scrolls, thrown into the street, torn up, and so on. Well. My parents realized there was no longer any place for Jews in Germany. And they had the good fortune to have heard that there was a country called Albania. Now, many of you know about the Balkans, and there are a few larger countries in the Balkans, but Albania is definitely the smallest. However, the only Muslim monarch of all of Europe, King Zog, had given orders to allow every Jew who wanted to come into the country to be given a visa, no questions asked, just come. You're welcome. My parents got visas. We packed up and we went to Albania in March of 1939 not knowing what to expect, not knowing what the country looked like, not knowing anything. At the time, Albania had a population of maybe a little over a million citizens. The majority, to be correct, 85% were Muslims, observant Muslims. 
They welcomed us with open arms. We were not refugees. In their eyes, we were guests who needed help. And according to the moral court of Albania, court Bessa, which means a promise, the stranger in my house, which extends to the stranger in my country, has to be protected, no matter what. We immediately had Albanian friends. We moved around a great deal for one reason or another. And as it turned out, I once made the account, we moved 16 times. And somehow or other, always lived in homes of Muslims. We were in a small town called Berat, which is in the center of Albania, and that was during the Italian Greek War. We had to go there because, not because we were Jews. By the way, Italy occupied Albania in 1939. They left us in peace. They, the Italians did not, um, you know, uh, persecute Jews the way they, the Germans did. They knew we were Jews, they left us alone. But because where we lived in Duras is a port city, and foreigners really were not allowed in a port city. So we had to go to Berat. We lived in the home of a wonderful, wonderful Albanian Muslim family. I'm saying wonderful because I think among all the families we met, maybe they were the most observant. It was, for my father in particular, such an eye-opener, something so unusual. Came Ramadan, and then came Bayram, or you call it El Fitra, I think. And the first thing was that in the morning, Somebody came and dug some holes in the ground. They slaughtered a few sheep. They cut it up, and in each hole they put parts of this animal. No one was there. They opened the gate, and poor people came in and took just what they needed. Either they needed the skin to make a warm coat for themselves or their children, or they needed the meat, whatever, not more and not less, and nobody was there to tell them what to take or what not to take. <coughs> we were wined and dined with kadaif, baklava, everything you can imagine. And we were invited to join them in the mosque, and we went with them to the mosque. It was really a most delightful, interesting, educational experience. We then moved again back into the port city of Duras and lived again a family that was very observant. We woke up at 5 o'clock every morning when they ate before starting the fast of Ramadan. And this is when the Germans finally occupied Albania. Now, I have to come back to 1942, first of all. Germany occupied the former Yugoslavia. The Albanian government opened the border and allowed as many Jews as possible to cross the border. The exact figures are not known. It's assumed that it was several thousand, probably 2,000, maybe 2,500. We're not sure. But however it was, they were saved. The German general in Belgrade knew exactly who had escaped and demanded that they be returned within 48 hours. He approached the interior minister, Mr. Kruyer, to return all of the escaped Jews. Oh yes, of course, we will find them. Yeah, we will return them. Mr. Kruyer took 
all of them and distributed them among the peasants, among the farmers, among farm families. And in the end, those that he couldn't find enough places for quickly enough, put them into a hospital and claimed that the hospital was under quarantine for typhoid fever. And I think everybody knows how dangerous typhoid fever is. <laughs> Went back to the Germans and said, Surely, we looked for Jews, but we don't know any Jews, we only know Albanians. Now I have to tell you, the courage, the incredible courage of these people cannot be overestimated. The brutality with which Nazi Germany ruled is well known. They could have killed every last person if they had discovered that they were hiding Jews, my God, the whole family would have been killed. My mother had met in Duras a family by the name of Pilku. Mr. Pilku had studied in Germany, engineering, met his wife there, a German, married her. I believe that she had converted to Islam because she observed everything. And we became very close friends with them. The Germans occupied Albania, and of course it was known that there was a nice German lady that had to be visited. Well, they came every day. This woman had the courage. Now, I can't even begin to tell you what that means to introduce my mother as a relative from Germany who was visiting. Now anybody, anybody could have said, see this person over there, that's Jewish. We all would have been killed on the spot. Indeed, one of these wonderful German officers who came to visit and spoke with my mother said to her, if a Jew or a communist would come near me, I would shoot him on the spot. To this day, I cannot believe how my mother kept her cool. It went very, it became very, very dangerous and very, very difficult. Yes, indeed, the, Ger the Germans in Albania demanded the list of the Jews. This was the first thing they did in every country. The Albanian government said, we don't know any Jews, we only know Albanians. And again, they showed an incredible, incredible courage. I have even proof of this. A gentleman, an Albanian um, historian, wrote a history book a few years ago, and he sent it to me. Unfortunately, I no longer speak Albanian, and I can't read it, of course. However, I went through the book, page by page, and there, on one page, he had repu reproduced a German document written by von Tatten and Miller. Von Tatten was the chief SS officer in Tirana, in the capital, and the other one was his uh, right-hand man or whatever. And the document said as follows, in German, to the foreign ministry in Berlin, we know what you want us to do. We do not consider it the right time at the moment to do it. The Albanian government will not cooperate with us. We will have to wait until our position becomes stronger in this country and we will have more military support. At the moment, we cannot do it. Oh, really? You forget, figured it out, huh? That the Albanians wouldn't... Oh, and, and there was another sentence in there, actually, which said, we cannot do it as you wish without the knowledge of the Albanians. They wouldn't let us do it. Very interesting. Had more countries had this kind of stamina, of this kind of
courage, many more Jews would have survived. Mm. However, when you do go to the Holocaust Museum or many other places where you can see the lists of the righteous among the nations, and by the way, I want to point out that among the one million Albanians, the righteous among the nations are 75 families, which is a pretty high percentage. But you will see, and I'm surprised myself when I see it, there are many names of Germans, there are many names of Polish people, there are many names of many other countries, and of course we do know that Denmark helped very much by smuggling Jews from Denmark on fishing boats over to Sweden, etc. But they did it also with a tremendous amount of danger because Albania was the only country where the government cooperated with the civilian population. In other countries, maybe not in Denmark, I don't want to say that at all, but in other countries, certainly in Germany and certainly in Poland, they had to fear to be denounced by their own friends and their own neighbors. The situation was something unbelievable. To point out, I believe, what these gentlemen were saying, if you are prejudiced against one group of people, you are prejudiced against every minority group of people. You can't single them out. Why would you be against Jews? Why would you be against Muslims? Why would you be against Christians? And by the way, the 15% of Christians who lived in Albania, Greek Orthodox and some Catholics, also helped. There were some of our people who were hidden in their homes. I was mentioning in the car when we came here, I did go to a um, Italian school that was taught by nuns, and there were some Muslim children. So the Muslim children and this one Jewish kid were allowed to remain seated while the Christian children were saying their morning prayers. At any rate, what the Albanian people did, there are not enough words of praise, of thanks, etc. I was invited back to Albania uh, with my husband and my daughter, and um, I was honored by them. Why? Because I wrote a book, and that was the first book that anybody had written about their life in Albania and how the Albanian people had received us. As I said, we were friends. We were treated as friends. We were not refugees, we were not foreigners. We needed help and they gave us help. Um, on the, uh, uh, before I come to this, another interesting story is we were living in another little city in the home of a police officer, a Muslim police officer. Okay. It was our Passover holiday. And the gentleman asked my father whether he would allow him to sit with us and participate in the Seder ceremony. I can't exactly tell you how my father was this broken Italian, certainly not Albanian, and maybe some English and German, I'm not sure, was able to explain the exodus from Egypt but it worked. The man sat through two evenings of the Seder with us. <laughs> Many years later, this was 1942. In 1945, 44, end of 44, the partisans occupied Albania and the Germans disappeared. And there was, for 18 days, fighting in the city of in the capital city of Tirana. And my parents had taken me to a family, one of our immigrant families, who lived a little bit outside of the city. They had gone back to our uh, room to pick up a few personal items. And on the way back, shooting started. 
And my father in German, of course, said to my mother she should lie flat on the ground. And a partisan woman soldier heard him speak German. And of course, she thought, ah, I caught some good German spies. So she arrested them on the spot, took them to the nearest military station, and lo and behold, God was very good to us. Believe me, God was very good to us. The police officer who spent two nights of the sailor with us was in charge. <laughs> he gave them the, 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 the customary hug and kiss, gave them a, a soldier and said, don't move again. Next time I may not be around. <laughs> Stay where you are till this is finished. And anyway, um, it, it, uh, it was a very interesting, very interesting experience. Now, what I was going to tell you was, and this is very, uh, to me, an unbelievable uh, incident. We were invited back, as I said, we, I was being honored, which was lovely, very nice. In City Hall, in Dulles, which is the, the uh, port city. And as I was coming out of the um, limousine that was driving us there, it's in the center of the city, visualize that here is the city hall, and across the street is the largest, most beautiful mosque. I've been in it. It's a very beautiful mosque. As I got out of the limousine, the city band came along, and they played the Star Spangled Banner. Mm -hmm. And immediately followed by the Hatikva. Mm -hmm. And at that very moment, the Moazit called the faithful to prayer. Mm -hmm. That combination was so unbelievable. I was unable to move. I was unable to move. All I could think is, if this can happen here, why can't we all live in peace together? You may ask me questions, please do. But I'd like to finish on the note of saying that our Talmud teaches us, he who saves one life is as though he saves the world. I'm here, I'm telling you this wonderful story about the wonderful Albanian people. We have four children. We have 14 grandchildren, and we have 16 and a half great-grandchildren. <laughs> and that would not have happened if it hadn't been for the Albanian people. Thank you very much. There are two organizations that I do want to mention to you. One is called the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. They have now 19 chapters throughout the United States. It's a lady who started it. She started it with members of her congregation. And the members of the congregation approached the local mosque so they had 40 Jewish women and 40 Muslim women, and together they have created 19 chapters. This last winter, now in January, they took a trip to Bosnia and Albania, and they called it Building Bridges. It's a fantastic organization, and they are very, very successful, and they're doing everything to build bridges. Now, the other thing is, in Israel, in Israel is a young man, his name is Yehuda Stolov. And he started a good number of years ago an interface organization, which by now has a total of 61 groups throughout Israel including places like Hebron and other uh, 
danger spots, let's say, or, 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 or sensitive spots, okay? They meet regularly. On Tuesday, January 12th, the Interface Encounter Association participates with its executive director and 10 of its coordinators in a round table organized by the Interparliamentary Coalition of Global Ethics, al sadiqin and Movements for the Culture of Peace and Reconciliation. Rabbi Benjamin Abramson, founder director Azad Dikin, Iman Mohammed Assisi, vice president, French Association of Muslim Jewish Friendship, etc., etc., there's a whole long list there. Uh, Druzim as well, for the culture of peace and social justice. And that's happening as well in Israel. Unfortunately, and whoever would like to read this in Arabic or in Hebrew can, because this is, comes always in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, we only hear the bad things. We only hear the sensational things that get into the press. That's human nature. There is a lot of good things going on, and we all should join and do our <coughs> utmost to promote this and to let it grow. <coughs>